things to come, and this is the last in the series of things to come. And uh, I want to talk about the great finale, the great finale. So uh, the doctor calls the patient, and the patient answers the phone, and the patient, uh, uh, as he answers the phone, hears the doctor say, hey, I've got good news and bad news. And, uh, of course, uh, the patient says, well, give me the good news first. He says, well, the good news is the report came back, and you got 24 hours to live. He said, that's good news? What's the bad news? Well, the report came in yesterday. <laughs> good news, bad news. How many have heard those kind of jokes before? Good news, bad news. Good, yeah. The Bible has good news, bad news, and it's no joke. It's no joke. There is a great finale, and the great finale, there's going to be a final judgment. That is the bad news. There is going to be a final judgment. Paul preaches of it in the book of Acts. You find it all through the Bible. Final judgment. The good news is you can kind of skip that if you've got your ticket punched and you're on your way to heaven. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I was an eight-year-old boy and placed my faith in Jesus. That day, all my condemnation, all my judgment was taken from me and it was imputed or put to the account of Jesus Christ to suffer and die on the cross. He paid in full all the price of my judgment. So I am going to skip that. I got bad news, but then I got good news. I want to talk about the bad news for a few minutes. The Bible is full of judgment. You can't escape it. If you read your Bible, you can't escape this. In Genesis chapter 3, you see, God had said, Adam and Eve, you can eat of all the trees that are in the garden, but the one that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can't eat of it because the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And of course, they saw that it was pleasant for food. They ate of it, and something happened. They became a ticking time bomb. Death was set in progress, in motion. Yeah, of course, Adam lived to be 930 years. But the Bible says, and he died. And he died. The curse of sin, the judgment came, the consequences for disobedience fell upon him and all mankind. You go a little bit further in the Bible, and God saw the wickedness of man was so great, he said, listen, I can have, I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand anymore. I'm going to send a flood, I'm going to wipe them all out. That's what the text says, Genesis chapter 6. I kind of paraphrased it. Then there's this little line there, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Whoa. He was a righteous man that walked with God. It made all the difference in the world. But judgment came. Judgment came. Judgment came. You don't have to go much further. You go in the book of Exodus, and uh, the nation of Israel was in bondage. They were suffering under the Egyptians. And God said he was going to redeem his people with great judgments. And the judgments were going to fall upon the, the Egyptians, but not on the Israelites, because they knew the Lord. But in order to show that you knew the Lord, you had to take and apply blood to the two doorposts on your, your doorway and over on the lentil post on the top. And when you did that, you were, you were showing that you were a believer. And when the death angel passed through Egypt, bringing judgment, the firstborn of every male in the family died. Judgment happened. But if the blood was there, they escaped judgment. If they had, because they were covered by the blood. They were covered by the blood. We could keep going. <clears throat> the nation Israel became an idolatrous nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and God <clears throat> told them that they needed to repent. <clears throat> he sent all kinds of prophets to them, tell them to repent, turn from their way, or they would go into judgment, captivity. <clears throat> and of course, they did not listen to the prophets, but in some cases, they killed the prophets. See, sometimes we think we know more than the prophets know. Sometimes we think we know more than God knows. Here's what they thought. We have the temple. God will not allow his temple to be destroyed. I mean, what would that be like? God couldn't, is not any bigger than in these foreign countries and all their little gods? God used the Babylonians to destroy his people and take them into captivity. That was judgment. Judgment. The greatest judgment of all is what happened uh, on the cross. I got this weird word up there, propitiation. You run across it just a couple of times in the Bible, modern translation, translations. Uh, they don't use it because it's not a familiar word to people, and so they replace it with atoning sacrifice. 
but that doesn't even come close. The concept of this word is that justice is satisfied. Judgment comes and something happens to satisfy judgment. Jesus on the cross satisfied all the judgment that would be directed toward the sinner if they placed faith in him. The Bible's full of judgment. Judgment. In this series that we've been doing, we kind of jumped towards the end of the different kinds of judgments in the Bible. And we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. It's a special judgment. Because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter what you've done in the past, if you know Jesus, you will never be condemned and judged for your sin because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But you will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what you have done because he will reward you according to what you have done and he will give you a reward or you won't have one because you didn't do anything for him. So there is no real punitive, there's no real condemnation, there's no sentencing to hell ever for the Christian because Jesus took care of all of that. Our judgment is simply, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful in this little, I will put you in charge of much. It's a powerful, powerful thought. We saw last time in Matthew chapter 25, when Christ actually returns to the earth, there will be a gathering of all the nations and he's going to judge all the nations. And those that are, 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 are wicked, we saw they're the goat nations, they're going to be cast into a place of destruction and those who are the sheep, the lambs of God, they're going to enter into the kingdom. Wow. Today, I want to talk about the final judgment. There's a lot of judgments in the Bible, but today I want to talk about the final one. There's one that's going to be the end of all judgments. Ju judgments are all going to come to an end. And then after that, I want to talk about our final destination. In order for me to accomplish what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to read a lot of scripture. Not really, I'm just going to drop some words in now and then. But you're going to say there's a lot of reading to do here because there's so much here I want to cover in just a short while. Okay. Final judgment. The time of final judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, it says, When the thousand years are over. So let me back up. We talked about the next thing on the prophetic calendar for the church age people is the rapture of the church. The word rapture is from the Latin Vulgate, and it's from the, the Latin that means uh, caught up. Rapimur is the word. It means to be caught up. And so we get the word rapture out of that. In 1 Thessalonians, it tells us, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive shall be caught up with the Lord to meet him in the air when he, he comes. But he comes to take the church out of this world and we're taken to the actual judgment seat of Christ. Our, all of our sins are paid for on the cross, so the judgment here is just rewards. We just talked about that. While, that, while we're being, receiving all of our rewards on earth, there's a time such as never was, Jesus said. It is a terrible, terrible time. We're going to miss that because God has not appointed us to wrath. At the end of this time period of the tribulation on earth and our judgment seat in heaven, we're going to return with Christ actually to the earth. And it's at that point that there's going to be a kingdom set up that will last 1,000 years. Revelation chapter 20 is where I know it will last 1,000 years. Nowhere else in the Bible does it tell me that. But six times in the passage it says it's 1,000 years long. And so the time of this is after that, there's going to be a final, and the final judgment is called the great white throne judgment of God. When the thousand years were over, verse 7, jump down to verse 11 in, in Revelation chapter 20, and it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was sitting on it. I, I didn't try to draw or put Jesus on the, the big white throne, and I'm not exactly sure it's going to look like that cushy chair, but uh, I had to have something to symbolize in our mind that there's going to be this final great white throne judgment and notice what it says. At the time of this judgment, watch the next part, earth and the skies fled away from his presence and there was no place for them. 1 Peter chapter 3, or 2 Peter chapter 3, it tells us that uh, the elements of this, this world are, are going to be destroyed. God is going to create a new heaven and new earth. So between, between the destruction of this earth and the new earth, Everybody is gathered at the great white throne judgment scene, according to the Bible. 
The people there, it says, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Throngs and throngs and throngs of people. In fact, if I jump down, and I go a little bit further here, it says, and, and death itself and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. The sea, of course, gave up its dead. You know, here's, here's the idea. But what if a person died at sea, and they threw him overboard, and he was swallowed by a fish? <laughs> And that fish was swallowed by a fish. Pastors say it doesn't matter. Does not matter. God is going to summon them from wherever they died in the sea. Then he goes and he says, and death and Hades gave up the dead. And death gave up the dead. The death here is saying, when you die and you go into the grave, even those in the grave are going to stand before God. And he says, and then Hades, everybody who has already died, gone into the place called Hades, Hades is like a, a jail. You go to the jail, and now you haven't been to the judge, but you're brought out of the jail, that's what Hades is, to stand before the judge, that's what the great white throne is, so that when you are then found guilty, if you're found guilty, you go to prison forever and ever, and that's called the lake of fire. He says he's going to summon all the people who have not already, and these are the people who have not received Jesus. These are all the people who, who, who are what the Bible calls wicked or unrighteous. They do not know the Lord. He's summoning them all, and it says each per person, he's going to do that. <clears throat> he says the books are going to be open. Notice plural, books. There's going to be a lot, a lots of books. We've got all these volumes in this library. Books are open. I don't know what these books are going to look like. Back in their day, books were scrolls, so the scrolls are going to be unrolled. And it's going to... It's going to be the evidence of what you have done during your life. Romans chapter 3 says that at that time every mouth will be stopped and every, everyone will become guilty before God. Now we're going to say, but, hold on, but, you're not going to be able to say, I object. Overruled. Here's the evidence. It's an evidence that God is keeping a record of everything in our lives. And another book was open, which is the book of life. We'll talk about that in a few moments. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Every mouth's going to be stopped. Shut up before God. I noticed this in the passage. And each person was judged. On that day, you're going to be judged for you, not for me. I will be judged for me and not for you. I'm not going to be able to say, or you're not going to be able to say, you're not going to be able to say, but you know, Pastor Dennis said, you're going to say, this is about me and you, me and you. What have you done with my son? What have you done with my son? Each person is going to be judged according to what he had done. The final sentence is given here, the sentence of, of, of it says, and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Oh, back in the very beginning, the first judgment. Adam, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Physical death kicked in. He finally died, nine or 30 years later, dead. But there's a second death. The second death is an eternal separation from God. You see, physical death is merely the separation of your soul or your spirit, your immaterial part of, your, of you, the you inside, from your body. When that separates, you die. The second death is to be eternally banished from the presence of God. Whew. That's the sentence. Now, there's an exception. It's, I just find this amazing. It says, another book was opened in verse 12, the previous to this, which is the book of life. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. Listen, you're thrown in the lake of fire if you've never had your name written in the book of life. And you're, you suffer the degree of punishment according to what you have done. But getting there, going there, is if you have not accepted Christ and had your name written down in the book of life. And I know it's the Lamb's book of life because in chapter 21, verse 27, it says, only people going to heaven are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's an old uh, hymn that goes, there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. The day I accepted Jesus Christ, my day, it was recorded. It's recorded. 
just like every deed that's ever done, it's recorded. My placing faith, when the day you place faith in Jesus Christ, it's recorded. You, your name is written down in the book of life. Now, if you've never received Christ, your name's not written down. Your name's not written down. You need your name written down. I want to turn from the bad news that, uh, listen, it, that's pretty gloomy. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. But on the other side, and your destination is not very, very nice, a lake of fire. But I want to talk about some good news. And the good news is this. After that judgment, those whose names are written in the book of life, they are going to a whole new destination. In Revelation chapter 21, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven. Let's see, I got the old, old heaven and earth there. A new heaven and a new earth. So the new earth, it says, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But there's no longer a sea. Oh, so I just made it all green grass. <laughs> all right. I, I, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I know that from both the book of Isaiah and I know that from 2 Peter, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and there's no longer be any sea in it. Well, where's the water going to come from? We'll see in just a little while. And then he said, I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is my drawing of heaven. I really fall short. I've never been there to see it. I, I couldn't pull out my, my smartphone and take a picture of it. All right, uh, I've read the passage here and, and tried to construct maybe just a, a display of some sort so you get an idea that, that there's this city that's going to be coming down. You say, it doesn't look much like a city to me. Wait till we describe it. Okay. He says here, as a bride, he doesn't say that the city is the bride, but it is adorned as a bride. How does a bride adorn herself? That is the one day of the year that she wants to look spectacular. This city is like no other city. It is spectacular. It is beautiful. You've never ever seen a place like this. Wait till you see my new home. This place is going to be glorious. It's going to be awesome. I saw the new, so there's a new city. A new universe, a new city, a new heaven and earth, a new city. He says then, the thing that's really cool is there's a new presence. God is with men. God is going to be in the city. And he will live with them. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if we're going to go down to a street, you know, knock on the door. And he say, come on in. He will live with them, and they will be his people. He's going to say, hey, you're... You belong to me. You're mine. You're mine. And God himself will be with them. I'm going to have access no longer to praying to God, but somehow visibly manifest that he is going to be there. I'm going to have access to God. He says God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away tear from their eyes. He's wiping away tears. I don't know if for the thousand years we still live with a little remorse that I didn't live my whole life for Jesus like I should have. And you know what? I don't think there's a person on planet Earth that can say, I did. But every tear is going to be wiped away because there is going to be no more, no more crying. If you're away from their eyes, there will be no more death, there will be no more mourning, there will be no more crying, and there will be no more pain. Anybody got a hallelujah there? <laughs> Amen. You like this? Does this sound good? There will be none of that, for the old order of things has passed away. Everything is becoming new. He who sits on the throne, that is God. Actually, Lord Jesus Christ sitting on this throne. He said, I'm making everything new. How many of you like to get new things? Yeah? How would you like it at, uh, you know, we have this thing every year called the Christmas flop. And uh, you get a nice package all wrapped up, and it's usually somebody else's old junk. And uh, 
when, when we do this event at the church where you do the gift exchange, you know, and you wind up with the, the booby prize, most people try to hide it somewhere in the house where they got it from and just leave it. <laughs> just leave it. What? That's not the way this is going to be. There's no one who's going to regret that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior because everything is new, everything is wonderful, everything is great, everything is marvelous. This is it, folks. This is the greatest. Everything is new. And he said, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. It's all over. Everything is new. It's, it's done. All the past. Listen, I am the Alpha and Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last. You take, this is a mirrorism. This is a way that, the, that they, they talked in the ancient world. Uh, often in, in Hebrew, they didn't have like a word for universe. They had no word for universe. So they said, heaven and earth. You take the two extreme opposites, and it covers everything in between. And he's saying here, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am everything. God is everything. He's going to be everything. You won't have a thought that is disjunct, disconnected to God. You won't have a joy that's disconnected from God. Everything, everything. Listen, it's done. I am the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. Isn't that what he promised the woman at the well? Hey, I'll give you something to drink. It'll be bubbling up in another place. He says, unto eternal life. I'm going to give you something to drink. We're going to be getting our water not from the ocean. We're not going to get it from the lake. We're, not, we're going to get our water from the one who gives us living water, the Lord Jesus Christ. He who overcomes will inherit all of this. And I will be his God, and he will be my oh, son. Son. Daughter. You're my begotten one. I sent my spirit because the Holy Spirit works the new birth. You believed in Jesus. The moment you believed in Jesus, you're born again and, and you got this new life. You are my son. You're my daughter. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts. The word magic arts is pharmakai. We get the word pharmacy or drugs from that. Those who are drug abusers, that's, that's what I think the text is talking about, the magic arts. You see, the, the magicians of the ancient world used, they, they used drugs to enchant and to, 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 to do things to people. And he said, hey, these drug abusers, idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery, whoops, fiery lake of fire, with burning sulfur. This is the second death. What a contrast of destinations. For those of us who know Jesus, it's heaven. For those who do not, it is hell. Now he turns his attention to our new home. You ever wonder what it's going to look like? You ever wonder what it's going to look like? One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues that's found in Revelation chapter 16. They pour out all these plagues upon the earth. And then one of the angels that was carrying them in this vision that he had, he said to him, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now we're talking not about the city, but about a people. The people is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. I know that from Ephesians chapter 5. He's talking about us, Christians. I want to show you the wife the bride. She's a bride, you know, she's a bride the full first year, you know, that's what you, she's a bride. And, and so he's, he's saying, I want to show you the marriage has taken place, Christ is now in union with the church, and, 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 and I want you to see the church. That's us, folks. That's us. And so he carried me to a high, great mountain in the spirit. This is a, in the spirit is a literary device that John uses through the book of Revelation to break the different segments of the book, and now he's taking him up on this high mountain so that he can get a glimpse of something really important. He said, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from heaven, coming down out of heaven from God. Remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, a place in heaven? Now this place, this city, is coming down from heaven, out of, out of heaven, and it's coming down. It's descending. Some people, some, some scholars, 
believe the city never lands on the earth. It's really a satellite. It's constantly in a descent coming around and around. Because once we see the size and dimension of this, it's too big to land on earth. It's too big. The new home, it's shown with the glory of God and brilliance. It was like a very precious jewel, like jasper, which would be kind of like a diamond. Uh, it was clear as crystal. That's what we want, right? A diamond, there's so, no, no flaws in it. And he said, it had great high walls. I'll tell you right now, I don't want to get too political, but God believes in walls. <laughs> it's there. All eternity, we're going to have a place that's got a wall. It's, you know what? It's a gated community. It's a, this is a gated community. It's a high, great walls, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And it goes on and says, and the city was laid out like, like a square. And you say, well, you don't exactly have a square up there. You've got this weird kind of looking building. It's laid out like a square. Watch what he says. As long as it was wide... And the length was the same. The wide, the length, the height were all the same. So it's like a cube, except the pyramid has those same descriptions. It uh, has the same thing. So I kind of combined the idea that it's a cube and a, and a pyramid because I don't know which one it really is. And, and I kind of drew this little picture up here so, so you can see it. And, and, but get the dimension. 12,000 stadia in length. Now, let me just kind of compute that over to modern... That would be, 12,000 stadia would be like um, from here to Key West. That's pretty big. Uh, let's go across the other direction. From here to almost to Salt Lake City. That is huge. In fact, this thing in the sky, if it were floating right next to the moon, would just look a little smaller than the moon. It's huge. Absolutely huge. Huge. I don't know how to describe this. Because people say, well, how, how are you going to get all the people into the city? <laughs> I'll tell you what. With all the people that ever were, they'll be like BBs rattling around in a boxcar. <laughs> this place is huge. He goes on and he says, and the wall was made of Jasper, the city of pure gold. Pure gold. Pure as glass. So there's a translucence to this so that you can actually think. There's a transparency involved. The walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Oh, man. Jewelers are going to be absolutely out of business <laughs> because precious metals, gems are everywhere. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Oh, see, it's a gated community. There's 12 gates to this place, and they're pearls, each one made of a single pearl. I don't, I've never seen a pearl that big, have you? It's a gate to the city. And the great streets of the city are pure gold, like transparent glass. You heard about the guy that thought, you know, he dreamed that he died, and he was taking all of his money with him, and so he packed up all the gold that he had, and he gets to the gate of heaven, and... Uh, you know, um, everybody says Peter meets you at the gate. You know, they're all named after the apostles, but he's not going to be standing there. But anyway, for the joke's sake. He gets to heaven, and he's got all this gold. And the guy says, the angel there, Saint, or St. Pete, says to him, uh, what's in the suitcase? And he says, oh, they told me you couldn't take it with you. <laughs> he opens it up, and there's all this gold. And he says, oh, it looks like you brought dirt. You know why? The streets are made of gold. Why would you want to try to even take anything with you? I'm investing now my life so that I get rewarded in heaven. This is just awesome. This is completely awesome. There is a new glory. He says, I did not see a temple there. You're not going to go to church on Sunday. The city had, it does not need the sun or the moon to shine. There's no sun or moon in the sky. The nations will walk by the light of it. This is another indicator to some that this is a satellite city that is going around this new earth that God has created and, and the nations are walking in the light that is coming off this city, the new Jerusalem. Now, I'm not sure about all that. That's all reading between the lines. But I do know it says the nations are going to walk in its light and no, on no day will the gates ever be shut. I, you know, I come to the conclusion, wait, we got gates we got walls. 
There's absolutely, as we could go on, there's nothing impure that will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They're the only ones that get to go in it. You have to be saved to get in the city. But since there is no, none of those other people, why do we have gates and why do we have walls? They're all pictures that God protects. We are protected by God. Protected by God. We go into the next chapter, 22. There's an absolute new life source. Then the angel showed me a river of water of life as clear as crystal. On our uh, Route 66 summer adventure, well, it was actually in the fall, but we stopped at the Blue Water Hole. I forget what state we were in. I think it was Oklahoma, one of them. And uh, there's this hole. It's, uh, it's, it's probably about the size of the building here. And, and it goes down 85 feet. And it is crystal clear. Absolutely crystal clear. They're going to have this crystal clear river flowing. As we're going to see, it flows from the throne of Christ. Where's the water source? It's coming from Christ. What do you drink? Drinking living water. As clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, it flows. It flows down the middle of the great street. So there's a great street somewhere in the city. It's Main Avenue. And on that street, it says, each side of the river stood, singular, the tree of life. So the roots must be below the river so that it's actually springing up. The tree is on both sides. And those who partake of the tree of life, listen, it bears 12 crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I don't know how they need to be healed at this time, but they heal the nations. They heal the nations. And finally, I get to what I think is the greatest thing. Every now and then, somebody will say to me, I don't know that I want to go to heaven. Man, all they do, all, all they do is they're like monks. All they do is sit around and say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God. No, that's what the angels do. That's what the angels do. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants, that's us, we will serve him. We're going to have something to do. I'm going to have an assignment. You're going to have an assignment. You're going to have a job. We, the Bible says we reign with him. We're, we're going to have uh, something to do in the coming kingdom and for all eternity. It's not like I'm going to be bored out of my mind Every day, something new, I'm going to have an assignment, and I'm going to have something to do for Jesus, and I'm going to get to hear him say, well done, Dennis, good job. Isn't that great? I'm going to be approved, I'm going to be accepted, I'm going to be loved, I'm going to have no pain, no crying, no fear, no tears. I'm going to have life eternal, and they shall see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And I don't know how it's written. I don't know if it's in Hebrew or Greek. I don't know if i got to have one of those, you know, when you go, go into the park, you know, and you go out and they stamp your hand and you put the little light over it. Oh, yeah, you can get back in. I don't know if they put a light on it. Oh, there it shines. I don't know if it constantly shines, if everybody reads. I don't know any of those details. All I know is I'm going to be stamped with the name of my Lord that I belong to him. Isn't that what we do? We write on our kids' clothes. We write on our kids' stuff. Right, we put your name on it. So when they go to camp, when they come back, oh, you got somebody else's clothes. Somebody's got yours, you know, because God's going to say, you belong to me. You're mine. You're mine. I get down, we're going to wrap up with this. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign, watch this, forever and ever. Because remember, we're going to see in Christmas season, when Jesus was born, the shepherds were told, and of his kingdom... There shall be no end. No end. No end. You know, I, I, I just think it's thrilled. Not only does our church have this what, glorious past, but we who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, the church, we have a glorious future. A glorious future. What a glorious place this is. I want to just leave the... Oh, I don't know why it's so small. I can't read it. Can you read it? I can't read that. The only, and I know what it says, though, because I wrote it originally, that uh, 
What a glorious place. That you're, you're, that's, we've been talking about your new home, but that's only your new home if your name's been written in the book of life. So the real question is, is my name written down in the book of life? The only way you know that for sure is you, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart, you believe unto righteousness. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord, confessing and believing, shall be saved. If you've done that, your name's in the book. Your name's in the book. If it's not, today's the day to do it. You've got to get your ticket. That's the ticket. You've got to get your ticket punched. Yes. I got my ticket to heaven. I don't have to go to the great white throne. I skip it. I got my ticket. I go to heaven. Do you have your ticket? That's my question. Let's pray. If you don't have the ticket, you don't. You say, I, I just know I don't. You can get the ticket right now. If you call on the name of the Lord, confessing and believing, so while your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, you just call and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner who deserves judgment. But I believe Jesus took my judgment for me. Right now, I'm surrendering my heart to you. That it's not by anything that I do, but only by what Jesus has done, that I can get to heaven. I accept you as my Savior and my Lord. Save me now, I pray. Father, I know that if anyone here has prayed that prayer with a genuine, sincere heart, the faith is counted for righteousness. The name is written down in the book of life. Not because I said so. Your word says so. You're the God who cannot lie. And so, God, I pray that everyone here, either today or previously, has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. So they have the ticket to heaven. Their name is written down now in the book of life. So when they show up at the window for the will call, there they get their ticket and say, yes, come in. Your name is written down. This is your new home. Help us, Lord, to be people of faith, realizing then as we live now, oh Lord, that we will be rewarded later for all that we have done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.